Virginia's wetlands are a wonderful assortment of interrelated ecological systems. Wetland types range from tidal marshes and swamps near the coast to non-tidal wetlands, which can be found anywhere else. Non-tidal wetlands have wet soils during a portion of the growing season and are above mean high water. This presentation will focus on issues regarding tidal wetlands. In general, tidal wetlands are areas that are wet or have wet soils during some part of the tidal cycle. There are two major tidal wetlands groupings, non-vegetated and vegetated. Non-vegetated tidal wetlands are intertidal flats, bars and beaches found between the mean high water line and the mean low water line. Although they are uncovered and seemingly devoid of life during a portion of each tidal cycle, these areas provide important habitat for a host of different marine organisms, aquatic birds, and many mammals. Vegetated tidal wetlands begin at approximately the elevation we call mean sea level and extend slightly beyond mean high water. The various vegetated communities, known as marshes and swamps, produce tons of vegetation per acre each year. Tidal wetland vegetation may include grasses, non-woody plants, shrubs, and trees. Wetlands are a unique and important ecosystem that perform several valuable functions. Plants that grow in the marshes and tidal flats die and decay, providing an important source of food for marine life, which also uses these areas for spawning and nursing their young. Wetlands are rich habitats for various mammals, marine birds, and migratory waterfowl. Vegetated wetlands trap and accumulate sediment because of their dense root systems. They also provide a buffer against erosion from wave energy. The dense growth of some marshes acts as a filter that maintains water clarity, which is important to clam and oyster production. Wetlands can also slow surface water flow and temporarily store flood water. Because wetlands serve such a vital function in Virginia's environment and economy, it is critical that they be managed properly. The many groups that may be directly affected by or have an impact on wetlands include property owners, land use planners, builders, watermen, and marina owners, to name a few. Working together with city, county, state, and federal officials, they are partners in protecting our wetlands. Shoreline erosion is a naturally occurring process. Storms, the movement of tides, and the gradual rise of sea level cause the boundary between land and water to recede and move inland. Erosion can contribute to the sedimentation and pollution of streams, rivers, and the Chesapeake Bay. This process leads to the loss of wildlife habitat and reduced water quality. Severe erosion can threaten property. Between 1956 and 1977, Virginia lost approximately 63,000 acres of coastal and inland vegetated wetlands. Wetland losses in the coastal area were dominated by urban development, which accounted for 43% of the loss. Human impact on wetlands include drainage, dredging, filling, construction of shoreline structures, groundwater withdrawal, and impoundments. Up until the early 70s, the long-term economic and environmental costs of wetland destruction could not compete with the short-term economic gains. Then, in 1972, Virginia enacted the Virginia Wetlands Act with the intent to protect tidal wetlands while accommodating necessary economic development. The Virginia Marine Resources Commission was given the responsibility of lead state agency. The commission, in conjunction with the Virginia Institute of Marine Science, has prepared these helpful booklets, which provide information on functions and values of wetland community types and shoreline erosion control structures. Under the Tidal Wetlands Act, most localities have chosen to adopt the model ordinance created by the Act and administer their programs through local wetlands boards. The Virginia Department of Environmental Quality is implementing the Virginia Non-Tidal Wetlands Act. The goal of the Virginia Regulatory Program is to achieve no net loss of wetland acreage and function. Meanwhile, federal wetland regulation under the Clean Water Act is administered by the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers and overseen by the U.S. Environmental Protection Agency. 
Other state and federal agencies may comment on wetland joint permit applications. Each agency has its own interest in the process, which may include improving or maintaining water quality, natural habitat preservation, public health, and recreation. Although the Wetlands Board is a regulatory agency, it's more than just that. The Wetlands Board works with the property owner, considering his interest in his property values and weighs those needs against the needs of the general public and the environment to develop a solution to shoreline erosion. In addition to the Tidal Wetlands Act of 1972, there are a number of other programs that provide protection to wetland areas. These local, state, and federal laws address environmental issues, including in and around wetlands. The overall purpose of wetlands laws and the agencies that enforce them is to protect and preserve these valuable ecological systems. Shoreline erosion is a natural occurrence. Storms, tidal cycles, and the gradual rise of sea level cause the boundary between land and water to recede and move inland. Non-structural erosion control methods, such as beach nourishment, grading, and vegetation, are less costly than structural measures. They also minimize impact on adjacent properties and provide habitat for wildlife. Structures such as bulkheads and riprap slow down or stop shoreline erosion and can protect coastal property and development. However, poorly designed and maintained structures can actually exacerbate the rate of erosion. That's why it's important to consult with the proper authorities in order to determine the best methods for erosion control and to guarantee the proper design and construction of an erosion control system. With the potential for impact so high, it is important that shoreline erosion control be considered from a comprehensive approach. By working together in partnership, measures can be developed that will meet the goals of the waterfront property owner, the goals of the general public, and the requirements of wetlands legislation. Since the passage of Virginia's Tidal Wetlands Act in 1972, the Virginia Marine Resources Commission, or VMRC, has processed more than 22,000 applications for proposed shoreline construction. The various agencies involved in the permit process consider which best management practices, or BMPs, would ensure integrity for the life of the structure while minimizing potential adverse impact from construction. Each proposal is carefully considered, and cost-effective conservation measures are often recommended. Where wave energy is relatively low, it may be possible to counteract erosion by non-structural means through the proper planting and maintenance of a vegetated intertidal zone or marsh grass fringe. This sort of shoreline erosion control is generally cost-effective and tends to preserve the shoreline's environmental balance. Non-structural erosion control projects are those that use bioengineering to create protective vegetative buffers. Non-structural measures are often your best choice because they have a minimal impact on the environment. They create vegetative buffers that absorb nutrients and they stop the transport of sediments. And they're aesthetically pleasing. A typical non-structural erosion sediment control project will take uh, an intertidal area and will place clean sand to fill in and will plant these marsh grasses. These marsh grasses are excellent in low energy areas because the foliage can absorb the wave energy while the dense root structure will hold the soils together. In those areas of high energy, uh, you may wish to use a, a hardened structure with planting together in combination. Sometimes, hardening the shoreline with structures is the only way to protect property. The installation of structural shoreline protection generally tends to alter the natural forces and evolution of shorelines. For that reason, it is important to balance the needs of the property owner with the environmental concerns of a given project. There are five major types of structural erosion control measures. Revetments, marsh tow sills, breakwaters, bulkheads, and groins. Rock revetments, also known as riprap, are sloping structures consisting of layers of stone placed along an eroding bank. The structure is generally composed of smaller core stone placed on filter cloth. This is then covered with at least two layers of larger stone. The wave action conditions at the site determine the size of the rock used in the largest layer, called the armor layer. 
When waves strike riprap, the energy of the waves is dissipated in many directions. This effect minimizes the ability of wave energy to remove sediment from the base of the structure. This riprap provides a marine environment for microorganisms. It's uh, properly installed will last a lifetime and overall is a good solution for shoreline stabilization. A marsh tow sill is a specialized form of riprap revetment. Marsh tow sills are designed to diminish erosion taking place on the face of a wetland scarp. In this case, the riprap is less than a foot higher than the marsh surface and there is no backfill involved. What we have here is a low profile structure. It's called a marsh tow revetment. It's designed to protect the face of the marsh against further erosion. It also allows for the inundation of salt water to allow the ecological functions to continue in the marsh. A bulkhead is a vertical wall that is generally aligned parallel to the shoreline and designed to retain soil or sand and to prevent wave-induced erosion. Bulkheads are usually constructed of chemically treated wood with galvanized fixtures. Other materials such as concrete, steel, and recycled plastics may also be used. Bulkheads must be properly anchored with tie rods and stakes. Bulkheads are not particularly effective at dampening wave energy. They tend to transfer the wave energy laterally along the face of the structure or vertically up and down. The cumulative effect is the loss of sediment in front of the structure and or along the side. Bulkheads are basically vertical walls placed parallel to the shoreline to protect upland soils from erosion. The major construction components of a bulkhead are the piles, the sheeting, the tieback system, and very importantly, the filter cloth. Bulkheads aren't very effective at dampening wave energy. When a wave strikes a bulkhead, it isn't dissipated as it would be as if it were striking riprap. Instead, the energy is reflected either horizontally, can cause erosion on adjacent properties, or the energy is transferred vertically, which can scour the sediments at the toe of the bulkhead and ultimately cause undermining of the structure. Placing the bulkhead as far landward as possible can minimize these negative effects. If a bulkhead is used, a suitable location may be in a cove uh, with limited wave activity or maybe in a narrow canal where there's limited space and again, uh, limited wave activity. Although bulkheads are typically constructed of wood, new material may be considered in certain applications. For example, this segmental wall was installed for its superior aesthetics, greater longevity, and its ability to follow the existing shoreline. However, this technology tends to be more expensive than traditional materials. Groins are one of the oldest types of structures used to deal with erosion. Groins are placed perpendicular to the shoreline and extend into the water a specific distance based on the configuration of the shoreline. The purpose of the groin is to trap sand moving along the beach with the currents. Sand accumulates on the updrift side of the structure, acting to widen and raise the elevation of the beach. Groins are not a preferred method of erosion control because of their impact on nearby properties. While groins protect one property, they can accelerate the erosion of an adjacent one. From an environmental perspective, groins are not a preferred method of shoreline erosion protection. In order to be effective, groins must trap sand in order to buffer the upland from erosion. The trap sand is no longer available to move in the nearshore system. Without this sand, adjacent properties may be at risk for increased erosion. Groins work best along sandy shorelines with large sand supplies. Most of the Tidewater Virginia shoreline does not have sufficient natural sand supplies to support the use of groins. If used, groins should have sand placed with the project. Groins should be low profile in design, that is, the waterward end of the structure should be at an elevation no higher than mean low water. The low profile design allows for extra sand in the system to wash over or bypass the groins once the groin system is full. A breakwater is an offshore structure aligned parallel to the shoreline. The purpose of the structure is to intercept and dissipate wave energy before it reaches the shoreline and initiates erosion. Sand and other sediments tend to settle out in the area between the breakwater and the shore, forming a suitable habitat for crabs, shrimp, and other forms of marine life. Breakwaters are stone structures that are placed parallel to the shoreline to reduce wave energy. 
They are generally used in high energy areas where there is a sufficient supply of sand. If there is not, beach nourishment landward of the structure must be considered. They are advantageous because they allow some semblance of natural shoreline processes to continue. Breakwaters can be a very cost effective and efficient means of protecting shorelines, particularly when you have a long reach of shoreline that has to be protected. Choosing which type of erosion control structure is best for a given project begins with a careful study of all the factors present at each location. Various organizations such as VMRC, VIMS, and your local government may assist in this selection. Free assistance is available through the Department of Conservation and Recreation Shoreline Erosion Advisory Service, commonly known as SEAS. A representative of SEAS can visit a coastal property and offer design options and a report. Professional consultants are also available for a fee to provide advice and assistance in the application process. The Shoreline Erosion Advisory Service, commonly known as SEAS, is a free technical service offered through the Department of Conservation and Recreation. The SEAS program was begun in 1980 to provide tidal shoreline property owners advice on how to control shoreline erosion. The property owner can contact the SEAS engineer who will schedule a site visit, meet the property owner on the property, provide advice on how to control the erosion, give estimates on the cost associated with those recommendations, return to the office and write a report that outlines the recommendations that he provided on the site visit. Erosion can cause the property owner to lose property. As the mean low water line moves inland, land that falls behind that line cannot be recovered. That's why it's important for property owners to take steps to control erosion as soon as they become aware of it, and to consult with the knowledgeable and helpful people available through the application process. The passage of the Virginia Wetlands Act and subsequently the Coastal Primary Sand Dune Act provided for the establishment of a management system that gives wetland regulatory authority to local governments. These acts pave the way for the creation of local wetlands boards, which serve as the regulatory agency in charge of the use and development of wetlands within their local borders. The Wetlands Board jurisdiction covers both vegetated and non-vegetated wetlands that are contiguous to tidal waters. This consists of land between mean low water and mean high water for non-vegetated wetlands. The jurisdiction of the board is expanded on the landward side to one and one half times the tidal range if wetlands vegetation is present. Other agencies have jurisdiction based on the laws that govern the use of each type of land. Application for the use of wetlands is done through the Joint Permit Application. The JPA is the single document needed to apply for local, state and federal permits in regard to tidal wetlands. Permits are submitted to the Virginia Marine Resources Commission. Any activity that encroaches upon or over jurisdictional wetlands requires a permit from the Wetlands Board, the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers, and in some cases the Virginia Department of Environmental Quality. Each permit application is reviewed by all local, state, and federal agencies with jurisdiction over the affected wetlands area. The structures on this property required authorization from several different regulatory agencies. The riprap revetment on my right required authorization from the Army Corps of Engineers, the Virginia Marine Resources Commission, and the local wetlands board. The portion between mean high water and mean low water required authorization from the Army Corps of Engineers and the local wetlands board. The portion below the low water mark requires authorization from both the Army Corps of Engineers and the Virginia Marine Resources Commission. To my left is a boathouse structure which requires authorization from both the Army Corps of Engineers and the Virginia Marine Resources Commission. The general process that joint permit applications go through includes the submission of the application to the Virginia Marine Resources Commission, distribution to various jurisdictional agencies, site visits, public notice and hearings, and final decisions by the local wetlands board, the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers, and the Virginia Marine Resource Commission the applicant must comply with the most restrictive permit issued. It's important to remember that signing and submitting an application grants permission to all regulatory and advisory agencies to send representatives to the site for visits. An important part of the joint permit application is the adjacent property owner form. 
This form is used by the property owner to convey to a neighbor that a project is about to commence. This form is then used by the neighbor to communicate back to the governing body their concern or support for that project. An added benefit from this form is it invokes coordination between the two property owners, thereby ending a much better project. Failing to submit an application and obtain a wetlands permit prior to construction can result in considerable penalties and fines. Anyone planning construction in and around wetlands should contact the local wetlands board for assistance and guidance. Economic development and wetland protection are not mutually exclusive objectives. Many commercial activities depend on the productivity and aesthetic values of wetland areas. Without wetlands, expensive alternative methods would be required to prevent flooding, control erosion, improve water quality, provide fish and wildlife habitat, and provide recreational opportunities. Our wetlands, if they are properly managed, will provide these services far into the future. Concerned citizens can assist in wetland protection through various activities, including attending wetlands board public hearings, locating and monitoring wetlands in their area, supporting wetland legislation, informing neighbors and developers of the values of wetlands, encouraging others to minimize their impact on wetlands, and volunteering to assist with wetlands restoration. All of us have a role to play as partners in protecting our wetlands.